You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. It's 30 minutes away. I'll be there in 10. Do it live! I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! You son of a bitch. Frankie, it feels good to be back talking to you on a regular basis. This is our second week of being back into the podcast. I feel like I feel like my joints are a little lubed up. I'm a little I'm less sore than I was last week, kind of get my brain racking on this again. I'm back in the groove. It feels good to have our our our, our, our Wednesday swag. I can always see what the, the latest fashions are at the Dick Sporting Goods, it's making me jealous with this like uh, kind of cross sweatshirt rain jacket um i don't know is it is it camo it's like i don't think i would definitely get shot first with that jacket my uh my wardrobe is always quite different than yours you you look polished and professional as always so frankie um we've we've been doing this podcast long enough now that our listeners have sort of heard all the gambits you and I spend a lot of our professional careers the last five years raising capital, both for, for real estate, both of our real estate. I have some that I've done myself. You've had some you've clearly done yourself. And then we've had a number that we've worked together on. I've had to raise money for um, our tech startup on multiple different occasions. So we've sort of been in fundraising mode for years now. Um, And we've had different types of, uh, capital we've raised. I think it's fun for us to talk today about how the market's different in 2024 because both of us are back out hunting for capital. That's sort of what you do when you're in business for yourself. Um, uh, but it'd be fun to kind of go into that a little bit today and talk about the most recent investment that you're looking to put together, the most recent portfolio you're looking at, and maybe compare it a little bit to the two that we've done in the past. Perfect. Yeah, I'm up for it. I think it'll be a fun conversation kind of talking about what controls, what forces a small business owner to look where for capital, right? Um, capital funds every business and you need it. It's it, it's sometimes, like I, I say this all the time, I have plenty of money. I just don't always have plenty of cash because sometimes you have to put money in different places and how you do it. Where the money comes from comes from a, a, a handful of different places. It's your own or it's banks. And when banks aren't really favorable, sometimes it makes more sense to go to the private sector for money. And if you look at it from this perspective, the stock market has been on a tear, a tear. Like I remember having a conversation with somebody 10 years ago and they were like, the stock market's at a peak. I think it's like two and a half times that. I and mean, you're gonna know better than I am of, of how much it's run. But like it, there's huge runs. So it's like, okay, market's frothy, stock market's high. Is it a good time as an individual to take some of your money off the table and put it into something else? That's some of the stuff I think we're going to talk about today. Yeah. And um, all of these things are linked, but different, Um, you know, the the different asset classes perform better at different parts of the cycle. Um, Right now, the stock market is certainly surging. It's certainly doing well. And it's, we both hold to the Warren Buffett mantra of hold it forever and it's always going to rip. So really just depends on your, it depends on your horizon when you're looking to take money back out, what you're looking to do with your capital, um, you know, and how much, how diversified are you? You know, I, I personally right now wouldn't want to be a hundred percent in stocks. Uh, I am not a hundred percent in stocks. I haven't been since I left NVR. I've, I'm probably more two thirds in real estate, a third in stocks, but I have more stocks, significantly more stocks than you. You have everything in real estate for the most part. I have a, a large portfolio in stocks and I love my stocks, uh, but I wouldn't want to be all in now because it is frothy and shit, it could double again from here. It really could. Um, it doesn't make me less stressed about where the levels are and it never feels good when it drops 30, 40% on you, which is coming sometime in the next five years. Yeah. So one of the things that I I feel really comfortable about is this. I think Ian is better than I am on a macro. He understands the market, the uh, the stock market especially, looks at different things. He's got inputs in Florida up and down the East Coast. 
I, I know a particular market very well, and I know a particular segment incredibly well. So I know Richmond, Virginia very, very well, and I, I know single family infill, so in the city of Richmond, densely populated the Henrico County, which is very, 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 very small. Uh, but I understand Richmond, that Richmond is the top. What 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 is Richmond market? What MSA in the country? I think it's top fifty. Uh, it might be fifty. It's it's somewhere between fifty and sixty. Like I, I fifty, know. like fifty, probably yeah. fifty. Yeah. Okay, and that's is that population? Is that housing supply? What what is that? What how would you rate rate your MSA? So the greater the MSA has a. Um, the, the MSA, which stands for Metropolitan Statistical Area, has about 1.3, depending on where you want, look, 1.3, 1.5 million people. And what a Metropolitan Statistical Area is, is if you have traditional television, that traditional television outlet will be seen by those people. It's how it works, right? So like if you look at Richmond and then the big major city above you is uh, Washington, D.C., and the big major city below you is Charlotte. Charlotte has its own news outlets. Washington, D.C. has its own news outlets. The people in our MSA are going to get their news from Richmond, Virginia. Like, and if you go into Charlottesville, which is an hour to the west, they have their own news, and so too does Virginia Beach. So that basically crudely defines what a metropolitan statistical area is. Um, and Richmond is about top 50 in size. I feel like people, I've always felt like Richmond is this um, sort of, sort of hidden gem um it's we always knew it really well because we worked at nvr and ryan holmes completely dominates the market so yeah. you don't see a lot of people there but it's if you bring up richmond to virginia to an average person who doesn't live in virginia they don't know much about it nor would they consider it re, re, like a desirable place to live or they don't i don't think they consider it undesirable either i just don't think they consider it relevant or big enough. And that's why I've always felt like it's a good opportunity. Yeah. One of the things that's hysterical to me about Richmond, Virginia is this, whenever people know I'm from Richmond, they're like, Oh, West Virginia. Fantastic. <laughs> exactly. like, no, you schmuck. We're not, we're not, no, <laughs> like, like it's, it's a different place. So let's talk about Virginia as a whole and then talk about Richmond kind of specifically, right? The things that Richmond has going forward are this. It's, it, it, it's a top MSA, but it's, it's a second tier market. It's not Boston. It's not New York. It's hard it's to like, get direct flights out of your airport, which is how I look at second tier. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass to get places, but it's less expensive to do so. Highways are easier to traverse. But now that we're post COVID and we're into a different world where some people still have an ability to work from home or there's policies out there, especially through the government where, hey, you can come three days a month and we consider that on site or five days a month. So what you get in Richmond, Virginia versus Northern Virginia or Washington DC Metro is significantly different. The median sales price in Richmond, Virginia for a single family home is $350,000. The median sales price, it depends on how you look at it. If you go DC Metro, um, what's it called now? DMV, because a little bit of DC, a little bit of Virginia, a little bit of Maryland. Yep. It's a term since I've, I've, I've left. But if you look at DMV, depending on how you look at it, it's somewhere between 650 and 850, depending on how tight it is. DC is the most expensive. So think about that. If it's 650 to 350, half the price is the median house. So if you can get to DC three days a month and live here for a significantly less cost, that's why people come here. One of the things he and I have talked about is Richmond's a net mi migration market from places that are way more expensive. Nashville, um, Austin, Texas, Southern California, DC. Washington, DC, Metro, New York, Boston. People move here. A lot of people don't move here from Charlotte because it's actually more expensive in Richmond than it is in Charlotte. People are going to Charlotte. So the way that the kind of a macro trend that's happening today is expensive markets are getting less expensive and inexpensive markets are getting more expensive. That's what's happening around the U.S. because of the great migration after COVID. So for our listeners that don't know Frank well, so Frank, Frank worked for a home builder that was based in D.C. for 13 years. Um, so Frank was born in Southern Florida near Miami, um, still has family near Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale area. And Frank's favorite place to vacation is Southern California. So when Frank left NVR to start a business that could be anywhere, so 
let's be real frank your business there are no barriers to entry to go to any city you wanted to you you were single you had no kids when you started the business you just needed to raise capital buy properties fix them up flip them or rent them what he does um so i always thought and at the time frank lived in charlottesville the only reason he lived in charlottesville is the company had asked him to go start a division in that tiny little bullshit town and that's where he was but he could have went anywhere and my guess people would always ask me where do you think frankie's gonna go i'd say my guess is he's gonna go to back to fort lauderdale he's gonna move to la or he's gonna come up to dc where there's more action. i always kind of thought those three things i knew charlottesville wouldn't last because one, they're just, you were getting bored of the girls there because it was such a small college town. You were tired of it. Um, but I always thought those three towns, and my thought was always, those are big markets. There's a ton going on in all three of them. And Frank will build a lot of contacts there and make a lot of money. Um, but you never did any of those three things. You stayed, you moved from Charlottesville to Richmond, which was contiguous, it was over. Um, and so you didn't. So maybe break those three markets down because they're all three a little different, but why didn't you pick one of those? Cause am I wrong? California is your favorite place to go vacation, Southern California. And you have tons of family and loved ones in Miami and you know, a lot of people in DC, you have contacts there. So were those, was I way off that those were choices that you thought of or maybe might think of? Yeah. I actually never really thought about the city. I thought about what I was going to do. And if I was going to go to a different city, if I was going to pick up and move, I would have had to pick up. I, I didn't have the same level of contacts that I had here. And at the time, 15 years ago, I had more contacts in D.C. So picking up and moving to D.C. would have made sense. But I had very low overhead. I had moved from D.C. Metro to Charlottesville and I got a huge relocation bonus. And I sold a very expensive home and I moved into a townhouse. And so my overhead per month was like $2,500 a month for food housing car. So I knew that I could live very, very, very cheap there and I could pick and choose what I wanted to do. So I didn't have to rush into something because of the way I'd set my life up. And I had a good life. I, I lived close to the downtown. I had plenty of space. I, ha I had what I needed at the time. So what I started to look at is entry points to market where I could buy real estate. And I was doing it in and around Charlottesville, but Charlottesville is a, is a wealthy, patient market. And what I noticed was I lived in Charlottesville, my office was in Charlottesville, but I was finding opportunity in Richmond, a lot of it. And what I didn't know about Richmond at the time is the reason the hedge funds haven't descended upon Richmond like they have in other markets is the inventory here is old. So we've talked before, we were joking three days ago that I don't buy things pre-World War II built of wood because I've learned my lesson. And I lose my ass on those. Termite. Exactly. So what I had figured out about Richmond was this. There was a lot of inventory that was being priced significantly below replacement value. So if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, buy all your material and drop it on the site, how much it would cost to buy those materials was way more than the cost that I could buy an existing house. And then I could rent it for significantly more than the interest rate that I was paying off on the money. So the reasons I moved to Richmond is the impetus to move here was personal. But the impetus to start business here is I saw things on sale. And I don't look at the market as well as Ian does. Like he's, I, when I have a stock market question, I call Ian. Um, but I understand real estate insanely well. And I knew that, hey, if I can buy a house for one fifth of the cost to build it, at some point in time, that's gonna catch up. So that's how I entered the market. And I actually traded nine houses I owned in Charlottesville for 30 in Richmond. Um, and, and that's how I kind of got some momentum in this market. But it's been seven or eight years now. You could still go to Fort Lauderdale. You could still sell assets, take your money. You could still go to Florida. You could still go to California. Why do you choose to continue to invest in Richmond today? In today's money, 2024, what is more desirable about the assets? Forget where you live, um, about the assets that you acquire in Richmond versus a, 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 big, a big sunny market? So I think there's going to be a time to move into another market. I really, really do. And I think that time is soon. Um, what I'm starting to see in the marketplace is there's a lot of opportunity if you have access to cash, because although everything you read, everything you see looks, looks good, the journal put out a story about six weeks ago. And what it said is, if the economy is so great, why, does American why do Americans feel so miserable? 
cash matters in today's market. So there's opportunities for people to do different things. And, and what I think I will go to, Ian, is my model, but new construction versus existing. So the reason I'm still in Richmond and still investing in Richmond is I have, an, I have a distinct advantage over everyone else. I'm a small guy who understands the city very well. If I move to the counties, I'm going to get my ass kicked. Ryan Holmes is there. All the publicly traded are there. So every bit of distinct advantage I have is in the infill areas. And what I'm good at is finding these deals that are too big for the small guy and too small for the big guy. And that's what I continue to lean into. I, can't, I continue to find things that, hey, there's 16 lots around the corner. Ryan doesn't want to touch those. Kahab Nanian doesn't want to touch those, but I could, and I could turn that into stuff. So those are the reasons I continue to do it here. And I think we're in a market now, and we're going to talk about this in a second, where interest rates are and where expenses are. You better be damn good now. If you're going to enter a new market, you're going to get pulverized if you're not great because the cost of capital is so high that you really can't screw up. So the reason I continue to do things here is I know it and I'm really good here. So if you move down to like, let's say Fort Lauderdale, even though you grew up there, even though you have family there, you don't know the ins and outs of the permitting offices. You don't know the ins and outs of, uh, of infill, of what the different lots look like, you, the competitive environment. And also it's a hyper competitive market, probably more, especially in your niche. I think what I'm hearing in your niche, in your price point, and what you like to acquire, what you purchase, what your team is good at, it is not nearly as competitive in Richmond um, as it would be if you tried to go to a Nashville, uh, Austin, in Atlanta. You know, some of the hottest markets in the country, they've got people beating down the door with capital that maybe that same attention isn't being drawn to Richmond in the markets that you typically serve. I think some of that's accurate. I think some of it's inaccurate. So I have a friend in San Diego who um, PPC is pay-per-click. Google's entire business is pay-per-click, right? They charge you money to run ads that people are looking for things. In my business, there are three times the number of pay-per-click options to sell your house in Richmond, Virginia, which is the 44th largest MSA in the U.S. versus San Diego. San Diego has 3.7 million people. We have one three, we're one third the size with multiple more people trying to get a pay-per-click market. So the competition is everywhere for things that are on sale in real estate. The thing that I have going for me here versus in Florida is I have, I have national contracts on material. I can buy material really low, but I'm going to get hosed if I go to a new market and try and find labor. Because I'm a new guy, they don't know me. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna have to pay a premium to enter that. You got market. a team built in Richmond, so if some dipshit in California tries to compete against you and buy things without a team, they're not gonna be able to add value to it at the level that you are locally. So at, I the, at the speed of which you do it, that's exactly right. And people really matter, especially in this market. Like, listen to this text I got from somebody I've known for years. Hey, bro. Hope all is well on a Wednesday morning. Um, I'm writing, I'm wanting to hire a new job super for new construction, houses and apartments. Do you have any ideas or a great ad that will attract the right person? Okay. Commercial and residential. And you're looking to write one magic bullet ad. It doesn't exist. The people element is the hardest part. Yeah. So what we do here in Richmond is we have the people part figured out. And if I took that to Florida or if I went to North Carolina or shit, if I went two hours north or two hours east to the beach, I lose my distinct advantage. So what I have to do to go into it new takes market, years to build it up. So if you went to a new market, you start with one person, you had a second, you had a third. It's it's a slow pro. You don't just go microwave a new market. You got to go build up a name, build up a team, build a culture. Right. Yes. You might need to bring some of your people with you from Richmond to help open that market. So it's a challenge. The other, the other thing is this. I quit my job in 2009 when I started this business. We were at the depths of the recession, the depths. It was hard to make money, but I knew it was going to be hard to make money no, no matter when you start. So I knew I had the best part of the economy behind me. And it's been a 15 year wind at my back because of when I started. Right now, I think we're facing headwinds. So if you're going to go into a new market, there's labor shortages, 
There's material costs are up. Municipalities don't want to do new deals because they're just they're, they're doing the opposite. They're trying to stop things, not promote them. So now is not the time to take that level of risk. Now is the time to pivot into something that has less risk in my own market. And that's why I'm going into kind of a little bit of new builds, a little bit of development, doing things that I know I can rent Section 8 and protect myself on the, on the downside because I, I, can, I can establish what the floor is. So you have to just pay attention now to the floor. And I know where the floor is in Richmond a lot more than I do in D.C., or Florida, or California, or hell, Virginia Beach. So, um, in two thousand, late two thousand nineteen, early two thousand twenty, um, Frankie and I put together a portfolio of seventy five single family homes in Richmond. Yeah. Um, we raised a substantial chunk of money, and it was a pretty simple structure. Uh, the investors were in on it and we participated in the equity. We got some cash flow out of it. Um, and it was done in what, less than two years. We did that in probably a year and a half, 13 months, 13 months, very soon, right through, through COVID. And those were what, one of our, our biggest lessons throughout that is COVID happened right in the middle of it. The whole world shut down. We had just raised $4 million and we had 75 homes that we were like, global pandemic, are we about to lose everyone's money? And funny thing happened. We just kept collecting everyone's rents because all of Frank's uh, acquisitions that were in this 75 deal portfolio were all within this section eight kind of tr most. Were workforce within housing. We're in a workforce housing band. Workforce housing. And so uh, even if people were losing their jobs, the government continued to cover what is it eighty five percent of the rent. It depends on the person. Sometimes it's zero. Sometimes it's a very small percentage, and sometimes it's a hundred percent. Yeah. So our cash, is, our cash flow stayed strong, and when it was time to sell, we gave a very strong return to all the investors, and we did it much faster than we thought. Um, and so that was one structure of raising capital, uh, and then year later, maybe a year and a half later. Uh, uh, Frankie called me again on a totally different idea. And this was um, more commercial. These were two office buildings that I won't say they were in disrepair, but they had been neglected for a couple decades. They were tired. They looked like someone bought them in the seventies and hadn't put a dime into them. The carpets were gross. The bathrooms were shitty. The offices were old. Just think old DMV kind of office. And Frank thought without a ton of money, I could really upgrade these and we could charge more rent, uh, especially on two of the main commercial buildings. So that structure was significantly more different though. So these were three commercial buildings. One of them we are planning to move into residential and build condos in, it's an old church, um, but we structured that very different. So Frankie, talk about how the structure of that second investment we did with Westwood um, the more commercial one was different than the first because it was pretty creative the way you came up with it. So the first deal, what it was, it was buy 75 houses. We closed December 2019 and 75 days later, pandemic starts. So we were kind of freaked out. But what Ian said is it's single family homes, most of which were Section 8. The government paid the rents. And then all this crazy stuff with PPP and everything happened. And what we did is we collected we collected money. And then as the market actually started to move up, we started moving some of these people out and then we sold. And we sold in a couple of different tranches. We sold retail, but interest rates were really low. So we could sell a bunch of those to a back-end investor, which is what we ultimately did. And we got through this in 13 months and we gave the investor a huge return. Like annualized return was like in the high 20s. So really, really good. But the reason we structured that deal and the way it was built we knew all those units were going to get sold because of where we were in the cycle. Where we are in the cycle today differs. That's why we're doing a slightly different deal today, and I'll get to that in a second. The, set, the, the second deal we did together is called the Westwood Bond. In the Westwood Bond, there's three assets, two of which are basically clean up, flip, get, get them renovated, but you're going to keep the kind of the footprint exactly the same and get those through the system. So we did that and we've done it very well. And we bought two buildings for $1.75 million that are in this deal. 
those two buildings today are worth almost eight million bucks. Like they're worth a ton. So we smashed on that deal. Now, the downside is we also bought something that needed to be completely overhauled. It's an old church. I've owned this church for seven years, a long time. Like that's, that's a killer. The good news is I bought the church for $300,000 seven, eight years ago. You can't build the sticks and bricks for the cost that I bought it for today. It's way below replacement value. But when we started to go for zoning, we had to deal with parking. We're converting a church. It, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a forgotten about church. They haven't held a mass there in years, but we're taking a church and converting it into something. So it's called an adaptive reuse. It took like three years to go through all the hoops to be able to build what we wanted to build there. And in the interim, interest rates were really low to really high. It's the biggest jump percentage wise in interest rates in U.S. history, last couple hundred years. And Material prices on bananas and labor has a shortage. So we start looking at all these things. And we're like, okay, this is going to cost one, one and a half million dollars to do the work. Now it's like three, four million dollars to do the work. And interest rates have gone from 3% to 8%. So this is what we did. We continued to collect rent on the first two buildings and pay all of our fees, all of our mortgages, and we paid the investors every single quarter because we knew we had enough rent coming in from the two buildings to kind of cover us for the other building if it wasn't performing. Now, as the market has kind of pulled back a little bit and there's some people a little bit hungrier for work, material prices have come down, interest rates aren't maybe in the eights anymore, they're in the low sevens or into the sixes, we're starting to get close enough where we think we can actually do a deal there. And I think we're going to start move, moving forward in the next few weeks uh, or a few months, certainly in the next quarter. Um, but the structure was different. Instead of giving an equity kicker like we did on the RBA 75 deal through profitability, we gave an ownership kicker. So right now everybody's getting interest. And then once all three buildings are converted and we pay back the initial capital, then those people will get ownership. So they'll get and they go from a 1099 to a K1. And then someday, like I just mentioned, this building is now worth 8 million bucks. We bought it for 175. 10% of that profit goes to the investor group. So we structured the deal a little bit differently. We paid a very low preferable interest rate of in 8%. And the deal we're doing now is got a higher interest rate because there's just not that back end sweetener with the deal because we're just uncertain of how we're going to have to move through them. Yeah. So the first two deals were very different in the one we were able to give a return, which was an equity return immediately. The second term, and we let everyone know this, this is a long-term deal before we give you your capital back, but you are going to, um, it, it's more of a cash flow play because 8%, you know, fantastic hit that's significantly above inflation and it gives you a nice premium um, on the risk free rate. And, um, but that one has a kicker in the end where you, once capital is given back on that second, you are then be transitioned into all the investors became a 10% owner in the entire entity. And what we always said was if, you know, if this thing performs the way we think it could in seven to eight years, it could be worth 12 million bucks, 13 million bucks. And what, you know, our, our starting point was 4 million. So getting 10% of that, we're giving out a nice distribution to people and they had their capital back. So it's kind of a risk-free upside after you've given that money back, right? That's right. Yeah. That's a good way to say it. So today, Frank is looking at uh, his newest deal that he started talking to me about. Um, and I'm interested in investing. It's it's kind of a running joke with a lot of my friends that I only invest in Richmond. And, uh, you know, my my point is, and I heard a lot of what you just said um, about Richmond's market, and I do love Richmond's market. I've always loved it. Um, when I was at MVR, I just saw how those divisions made a fortune in our company. They were they were always, you guys were always chasing Richmond for division of the year, profit center of the year. Like they did really well uh, in that market, lots of different spaces. But more than anything, I like to invest where Frank's team is. Um, and because I saw, I saw with the first deal we did when we went through COVID, the power of having, it's not just 
Frank had good construction managers fixing up those 75 properties. It was try talking to tenants who don't want to pay you during the middle of COVID because they're worried about their job or they're now living from home or he has an entire tenant management team that works with people on their leases that works with the city on the workforce housing to collect those payments. We went through March, April, May, and I would ask Frank, what percentage didn't we get the rent on? And he'd be like, five? It was under, it was under five. It was closer to three. It was the scariest. Like, April, May, put yourself in that 2020. So for me, I was sold on that, um, of the power of having a really good team, a good culture, a stronger, you know, as 30 people working that intimately know Richmond real estate and and also know how to work within the parameters of the city and you know different section eight housing. So when it was time to do the second deal, it was obviously a no brainer. And this one, the assets, whereas in our deal number two that we did together were much different assets. They were commercial assets, um, large office buildings. This third deal that Frank is putting together now are almost identical assets of our first deal we did, RVA 75. So it's, uh, Frankie, it's 50 single family homes that you have owned for five to seven years. So the, the first deal, what we were doing was we were buying the assets and we need some capital. We acquired a portfolio from an old guy who was doing some estate planning. Boom. And didn't we know anything right. about the properties, didn't know anything about the tenants. He gave That's us right. some info, but you can never really totally trust someone who's selling. But the these were properties that Frank had walked. He knew what they looked like, didn't know all the surprises waiting for us in those buildings. Today, you've owned these properties for a so while. With the, with the 75 deal in 2019, interest rates were in the sevens to, to acquire. And um, we needed a little bit of capital, so we went out and raised some, and then we needed the capital to put the facelift on these to flip them. Yeah. Now, the difference now is those were unknown assets that we went and studied. This portfolio, and the reason it's built a little bit differently, is 50 single families in and around the city of Richmond, but I already have owned them, rented them, and I know the people in them. And in some instances, when you rent some, when you renovate something like they do on TV, you don't renovate for rent the same way you renovate for sale. Those are different things. But the biggest difference between these assets and the last assets is I've owned them and I have primary financing on them. And I did all my primary financing at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022. So these 50 assets have interest rates below 3.75. And there are different banks and different rates, but I have 3.75, 3.625, and 3.5% over 30 years. 33 of these 50 will go out another 20 some odd years, like to 2051, I think. So those are set in place. But there's 17 of these that reset at the end of 2026. So short-term so debt. So there's 50 deals. There are three tranches of debt, really, but the the tranche of debt that Frank is most interested in is the 17 he's talking about, which is on short-term debt that is expiring in the next five years. That's right. And you say, why did you get short-term debt? Well, I was chasing after these low debts. Some people were doing 30, some people weren't, but every bank had like the amount that they would actually give you was different. So you had to chase what you could get. These 17 make sense. So what we're doing is we're gonna pay above the safety rate of the three year, the 10 year, we're gonna pay double that. Like last time I looked that rate was around 4.11%, we're paying 10 and a half percent. And what we have is we have a portfolio that's rough, roughly worth 15 million bucks and we owe something around seven. So we've got tons of equity in the portfolio. So it's really safe, it cash flows really well. The government is paying the rents so if we go into a crappy market, the government's going to pay the rents just like they did in COVID. And all of those things are kind of set this way. Now, our exit strategy is going to be one of two. We'll either fix the 17 and sell them, or if rates pull back down on those 17, we can refi. So the reason we're not doing an equity kicker is we don't want to tie ourselves in on the back end. As long as we pay the investor back, in that time frame, we give ourselves these two different outs. So what's really, really critical is knowing where you are at the entry point and what could change over time. And you want to enter with a couple of outs 
in case the market goes to hell, in case something goes crazy, in case there's a pandemic. We wanted to have those things in place. So that's why we structured this deal this way. So in all three of these cases that we're talking about, all three of the vehicles that uh, Frank has structured and I have invested in, um, in all three cases, Frank needed cash, needed capital. Um, and for whatever reason, felt like the private route was both both more affordable and less of a hassle. They, it, it works faster. Speed to market is easier than working with a, a bank, especially when you have significant debt. Yep. The, all three of them offered different things to investors. The first one was a pure upside play. The second one was a cash flow plus a little bit of upside. This one, because it's short term in nature and he plans to give all the capital back in two and a half years, is a complete cash flow play. So it is structured as a bond. And instead of a return of 8% with a little upside on the end, it's a 10.5%. Uh, yield, pref yield that you get, um, but just picture a bond and making ten and a half percent on it. So you put a hundred, hundred thousand into it, you are getting ten thousand five hundred a year cash flow money sent to you. Well, you're going to pay investors out, I imagine, quarterly, like you typically do. Once a quarter. Yeah, once a quarter. So um, it's a pure cash flow play, and then it's a bond. So it's backed by the collateral of fifty properties. And those 50 properties are worth $15 million and Frank is raising two and a half million bucks. So low risk based on assets that are performing and have been for five to seven years. Um, and because of that risk profile and that low floor of you know performance, the, um, the upside is different on the back end and the payment, the cash flow is significantly higher than the previous two deals. So this is, you know, for me, this is a way of diversifying a little chunk out of stocks because the stock market is a little bit frothy right now. And it's, you know, it's more passive income. It's another check that I receive from Frank every three months. And I'm not terribly concerned about whether the value of my principal is going to go up or not. I feel really confident I'm going to get my principal exactly back. And in the meantime, for allowing Frank to hold it, I'm getting paid a generous um, premium over the risk-free rate of four and a half percent. Yep. And the way that this really works out too, and like in building out this bond pack and thinking about it, it, it's this, this is the equivalent of a municipal bond with federal backing because the rents are coming from municipalities with the federal government behind them. And the difference is instead of having some county employee, you know, being in charge of your money, you get someone who participates in the private sector that has to deal with incredible competition and is in a monopoly or an oligarchy like a city government. Um, you got someone like us who has a strong team that has we're sharpened by the capitalistic marketplace, but we're performing inside of something with a lot of protection because it's got the backing of both the city, the county and the federal government. Yeah. And, it, you know, as an investor, when you invest in a bond, really all you really care about is the yield and what's the collateral backing the bond, right? So, right. you know, a, a bond is structured that you have to pay me my capital by a certain date. Uh, and if you don't, I own whatever the collateral was. No different right. than a, a mortgage bond, right? I would own yeah. all those homes if they didn't pay me back at the end of the term as promised. Uh, so for me, I have to just be confident in the collateral. If it, one, do I like the yield? Yes. Two, do, do I like the yield? Is it enough where I would rather have that there than in equities, stocks, other things? For me, yes, because I have plenty in stocks and it's volatile right now. So, you know, if the stock market does drop 20, 30 percent, I'm not going to panic, but it's going to be nice that I have a few other assets that are generating cash for me that I could take that cash and buy more stocks. Uh, is he sending some of that when the prices are a little bit lower? Uh, but three, do I believe in the assets? And, you know, a reason why I normally invest with you is uh, one, you're my friend, I trust you, but two, you understand that asset class really well. And you don't normally go for private funding if you didn't believe completely in the assets you were choosing to go raise capital on. So that's, that's kind of how I look at whether I wanted to invest when you approached me on this one. So one of the uh, one of the questions that I've gotten from somebody is like, have you ever done this before? And the answer is, yeah, I've done it with Ian three times. 
my personal relationships with personal bankers, I've raised and returned more than 60, 60 million dollars. So I didn't take it all at once, but I took it over time and paid the interest, paid it back, did it again. So banks, I mean, I have exposure with banks that probably into the hundred, the money I borrowed from banks and paid back to banks is probably into the two, 300 million range. And I've done private money with probably 50, 60 million. And the reason I say that is this, Ian's been involved in three of these deals, but I've done thousands without Ian. Um, and the reason that we do it sometimes like this is Ian has friends and Ian, Ian is better at presenting this than I am. And Ian has access to folks who I think speak a similar language. I'm an equity guy. That's where all my money is. Ian's a debt guy. He buys stock, he buys options, he buys different things. So having someone like Ian help me get a message out there is something that makes sense to me because he's got a different skill set than I do. And when it's kind of one-offs or banks, I do that on my own. But when it goes to the broader market, Ian has a, a way of communicating that I, that I don't have. So that's why we do these kind of things together. Why not just take out more debt on these 50 properties, Frankie? Why do, why do a private offering at all? So that's, that's like the million dollar question, right? Why? My average cost of capital is 3.67% on this bond, just under 3.7. If I took this to a bank today, I'm going to pay almost 7.5%. So why do that? To pay a 10.5% pref saves me almost, it saves me $400,000 to $600,000 per year to go to private people, then they go back to a bank. The 30 year fixed money that I have and the, the interest rates that I have even on the reset debt is so low. Like you don't want to go to a bank. You do everything humanly possible to keep it, to keep that in place, that, to keep that interest rate in place. That's exactly right. And, and what happens is this, when you first start a business, like it's all about your P and L, your profit and loss statement. I've been in business for 15 years and I make good decisions. My balance sheet is an asset. In this instance, I'm taking 50 units from my balance sheet. I've got hundreds more. I'm just taking 50 and I'm taking a small chunk on top of that. Just a small chunk, two and a half million. There's about five to six million in equity in there. And I'm only borrowing, you know, two and a half ish of it in order to have the cash to reinvest into the portfolio to kind of push values, those types of things, because it makes sense to do so. And it's secure. Like Ian asked the question, I'm like, my mom and my sister, like it's, <laughs> you don't want to ruin Thanksgiving or lose your parents' money. So it, it's secure stuff with a good rate of return. Yeah, that's one of my favorite questions to ask him always. I, I trust Frank. I, it, it, he, he tells me the truth anyway, but I'm, I'm always kind of like, am I putting my mom in this one? Right? My mom's, my mom's in her high, high 70s right now. She's, you know, done well enough, but she's not a whale. Right. My mom is not a multi-billionaire by any stretch. So whenever I ask him that, I say, I put my mom in this. He always says, yes, you're putting mom in this. And yeah. if that's what he says, that's one of my qualifying questions that I normally ask. Because there are some things he would say, nope, don't. This one we're taking. We got a lot of upside on this one. We could go do this. Like, but there's a lot more risk in this. Don't put mom in this. There are deals that Frank does not get his family involved in. They've got more upside, but they also got a lot more downside. We tend to choose the low downside deals to raise private capital with friends and family. We don't tend to, we do. The stuff, we, yeah. the, the, well, the, we do. the stuff that's speculative, I do alone because it could go to zero and if it you goes do it to with zero, debt. You do it with bad. you do it with debt, you do it with a mortgage company that if you have to disappoint them, cool. You're just some banker and I'm in line with someone else. You don't like like Frank said, you don't like to ruin Thanksgiving dinner. No. And one of the things I think is, is kind of important to talk about with this is what, how do we come up with this idea? So E and I have a mutual friend. Um, he's an attorney. He's a very well thought of attorney. Um, he's someone who knows my business intimately. And for many people who've worked at Ryan Holmes, you know this guy because he's been corporate counsel for years. He looks at the balance sheet and he says, I think this is your spot for growth. He goes, this is a smart moment to do this. this the market needs it. It's super safe, two, two and a half, almost three times what you can get on a one or a three-year T-bill, securitized by the government, 
And it's a good place for people to diversify, people with cash, people with money. Like if you had a job and you quit your job and your 401k is just kind of sitting there, you don't know what to do with it. This is a perfect place you could invest it from this perspective because these are, that's, it's the right thing. If you're sitting on cash, if some of your cash is levered in the market, or if you're, you have, you know, an old 401k that is now um, an IRA, it's a perfect place to put money. Yep. So awesome. So it is, uh, it is April 3rd. When are you trying to close this by end of the month? Yeah, I think so. That makes sense. Yeah. That's typically we've been kind of in the 30 to 45 days to, uh, put it all through. So, uh, should be fun, right? Uh, that's these kind of, these kind of private placements are, they're exciting. They're interesting. They're, they spice up a portfolio a little bit. They help. I like them because they diversify so that if, I'm looking at CNBC on any given day and the market is crapping. I like to, uh, uh, I like to smile and think to myself, Hey, I own a collision center that's sending me a large check on Monday and I don't really care what's going on with the price of it. Right. Uh, because you have to balance that out. If I was all in on stocks, I would, my mood on any given day would be what happened with the stock market. Whereas in some of these more stable assets, it's just nice to know almost like a day job, it's the closest thing I could think of to being an employee again, where I get a paycheck every month. Exactly. Frankie, always a pleasure. This is this is deal number three we're talking about. I can't wait for deal number 30 one day. We're going to have gray beards and be like, remember back when we did that first bond? <laughs> I can only imagine. Mortimer, how- Mortimer, wasn't that a fun one that we did? I can only imagine how much I'll have to pee at the end of an episode then. Oh, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Frankie, you have yourself a hell of a day, big boy. You too, brother. See you. See ya. If you like what you just heard, and judging by the viewership numbers, you did, hit that follow button and leave us a five-star review. It helps other people find the show. It lets Frankie and I know that, you know, a few people are listening to this. <laughs>